Hello and good morning, everyone. It's great to be back here for another LinkedIn Live session. I'm glad to see those of you who have joined us for previous sessions, and I'm also thrilled to see new community members joining us today. I love holding these live events because they give us the opportunity to join our community together and to give a sneak peek of the incredible offerings our team provides. It's just a sample of the interviews, panels, roundtables, discussions, and briefings that you'll find at our award-winning virtual cybersecurity summits, conferences, and CyberConnect web briefings. If you haven't yet, make sure you check out our upcoming event schedule. We're hosting our Denver Virtual Cybersecurity Summit next week on Thursday, July 22nd, and I hope to see you all there. Our team will be sharing the registration link in the chat, so be sure to register now to guarantee your spot. And next week's summits will have a specific focus on the Rocky Mountain region and will feature educational sessions and discussions from industry experts. Plus, we'll hear from some of the region's top security leaders at our CISO roundtable. But today's LinkedIn Live briefing will give you a taste of what to expect from our keynote speaker at next week's Denver Virtual Summit. Remember, this is just a preview and you can count on a more in-depth discussion next week. So I'm both honored and excited to welcome Pamela Clegg, Vice President of Financial Investigations for CypherTrace. Pamela works across multiple government offices and agencies, plus law firms and financial institutions worldwide to train officials and employees about the vast financial crimes taking place within the cryptocurrency ecosystem. Cryptocurrency has empowered cyber criminals to take advantage of organizations and threaten them with multi-million dollar ransoms, but thanks to the anonymity this type of transaction offers. But people like Pamela are a step ahead of these bad actors. Using blockchain analytics, investigators are able to track and trace the flow of funds, often demotivating state actors from pursuing larger ransoms or further attacks. So Pamela is here with our Chief Strategy Officer, Michael Hiskey, and they want your questions. It's your participation that makes this all, our live sessions, really come to life. So be sure to post your thoughts in the chat so that we can answer them in real time. So without further ado, I want to give a big welcome to Ms. Pamela Clegg. Hi, Pamela. Thank you for being with us. Well, hi, Don. Thanks so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. You and as thanks, well. And thanks for letting me uh, ask Pamela some questions. I know our community members are super, super excited to hear more. Okay, I'll let you two uh, run with it now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, Pamela, Dawn gave us kind of a thumbnail of your background, but tell us a little bit more about yourself to get us started. Sure, of course. So I'm the Vice President of Financial Investigations for CypherTrace. CypherTrace is a blockchain analytics cryptocurrency intelligence company. We're based in Silicon Valley, uh, and we've been in this business since 2015. Um, so it's quite a quite an interesting ride. There's never a dull day in crypto is kind of the expression. And there's definitely not a dull day, especially when we combine crypto and ransomware. Yeah, I, I can imagine. So uh, the, uh, oh, and I was, I, sorry, let me bring myself back on screen. <laughs> so you're going to be our keynote present, presenter next week at the Great Plains Virtual Cybersecurity Summit. We're going to give people a little taste of that, as Dawn alluded to. So. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, so the thing on everyone's mind, and we'll get to it, is asset recovery with crypto. So it's kind of a lot of what you do, but it's a little known fact. So our audience is totally read in, right? We get it. Ransomware paid by Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency. So this is the 201 discussion for all of y'all listening. So tell us a little bit about asset recovery and how that actually happens. Sure. So first of all, what makes asset cover possible even with cryptocurrency is the fact that Cryptocurrency is what we refer to as pseudonymous and not anonymous. Um, so the beauty of that is that the blockchain gives us this transparency and allows us to trace the crypto funds, um, either their, their provenance or actually trace them to their destination. So the way that crypto asset recovery generally works is we most often grab it at an exchange. So when I refer to an exchange, I'm talking about a centralized exchange, something like Coinbase, something like Gemini, Binance. Um, the centralized exchange 
are the most um, utilized methods of asset recovery in freezing funds. We have seen, um, as in the case with Colonial Pipeline, which foreshadowing just a little bit, uh, we have seen also law enforcement able to recover cryptocurrency funds by actually gaining access to the private key, which means they take over the actual control of those cryptocurrency funds via uh, the wallet, somehow they're getting physical access to the wallet, or they were able to intercept or discover the actual private key somewhere. Yeah, interesting. Now, Although not used exclusively for uh, nefarious activities, uh, certainly ransomware and uh, let me put it this way, certainly ransomware and cryptocurrency have tended to co-vary over you know maybe not the very last year or so, but certainly in years past. And, and some people argue like, hey, you know, I can't understand why we need cryptocurrency if not for you know the nefarious things on the dark web. Tell us your point of view on this. Well, sure. I mean, we definitely see growth in both sectors. It doesn't mean that they're actually, you know, correlated one with the other. Um, when we look at the overall cryptocurrency market, the current cap market capitalization for all cryptocurrencies, I just checked just before we went live, is $1.3, $1.4 trillion, trillion with a T. Um, so that's the market capitalization for the entire cryptocurrency market. If we look at how much of that is actually used for illicit or nefarious activity, most estimates have it at least below two to 3%. Some estimates have it even under 1% of the entire market that is actually illicit or nefarious type activity. And, and so when people say could ransomware uh, kind of be the, the, the decline of crypto or you know pull uh, nefarious activities basically make crypto become illegal, there's sort of just no way we're on that path. Yeah, it's definitely not likely. Um, we actually see the opposite occurring. We have more and more financial institutions, banks, big banks, little banks, community banks coming on board with cryptocurrency and actually getting into cryptocurrency as an investment or even as a payment or a payment settlement mechanism. So you know, we, yeah. we definitely see the trending in the other direction. Yeah, and we recently had uh, the mayor of the city of Miami, who's big Bitcoin, Bitcoin supporter. So you can pay your phone, you can pay your uh, water bill and your electric bill now if you live in Miami via Bitcoin. There's, so there's a lot of even municipalities starting to really embrace that. Um, sure. So let's talk a little bit about ransomware. So you investigate um, some of the things that happen in terms of the crypto payments and ransomware. One of the things that's been brought up recently, uh, October 1st of last year, the Department of Treasury put out a memorandum, which really, it wasn't new information, it was just a reminder, like, oh, by the way, <laughs> if people uh, that you're transacting business with are on the OFAC list, right, the Office of Foreign Assets Controls, then uh, that's not just you paying money, that's you committing a crime because you, you can't transfer money to those people. Uh, right. Is that well known? I mean, what happens in the negotiations and, and sort of give us a little behind the scenes here. Yeah, it was the official reminder, right, um, that came out from OFAC, letting us all know, hey, by the way, right. if you do decide to make a ransomware payment and that ransomware payment is destined for or we find out either you know, after the fact or during the, the, the execution of that payment, that that is actually a sanctioned organization that you're making the payment to, right? So you could think of maybe WannaCry, uh, which we know were the North Koreans. You could think of Sam Sam Ransomware, um, very well known several years back. That was an Iranian group. That was um, uh, what brought down the Atlanta, city of Atlanta. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So those would have, it, following this OFAC statement, they, those technically would constitute a sanctions violation if a cryptocurrency or if, if the ransomware payment using cryptocurrency, whatever method is made to those organizations. Um, so OFAC came out and, you know, made this official reminder noting this and, but also said, you know, we want to work with the victims. We understand we don't want you to be victimized twice. Right. But this is something that we are very much paying attention to. We don't want ransomware payments to further, you know, uh, proliferation of, ma of, of weapons of mass destruction. We don't want it to, you know, further cybersecurity attacks that come out of those those countries as well. So yeah. uh, we haven't seen OFAC actually utilize this as an actual sanctions violation as of yet. Mm -hmm. um, there could be a couple different reasons for that, and we'll we'll get into that um, next week during the discussion. Um, but it is something to keep in mind, and it does require ransomware victims 
and the incident response firms that they utilize to do their due diligence prior to making a ransomware payment. Mm -hmm. Now that could be difficult. So the org organizations demanding ransomware, first of all, they're, they're wind up being uh, weapons of mass distraction as we'll get into in a moment uh, with Colonial Pipeline, but uh, they make it hard to figure out who they are, don't they? Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, on the crypto side of things, uh, they the, the way that a ransomware payment is actually executed is that the ransomware act actors, the operators, will generate a new unique cryptocurrency pay address to receive that payment. What that does in the Bitcoin world or even in the Monero world, whatever, whatever cryptocurrency they're utilizing for their transaction, is it limits our ability to do some analysis prior to payment because if the address is new and it's unused, it hasn't received its first transaction, it doesn't show up on the blockchain yet. Mm -hmm. So we can't actually mm -hmm. jump on there and kind of do a little bit of a funds analysis. Huh. What we can do is working with primarily the incident response firms and law enforcement is if we can identify the group that is actually behind the ransomware attack, if we can identify the group, then we can go and look at past payments that we have attributed to that group and see where those payments have you know, flowed to or from and, and then identify maybe are they using a particular exchange? Are they you know, using dark markets in a particular part of the world? Things like that. So that's a that, that's the wallet is sort of a, a it could be a single use wallet. It has a unique address. This is both kind of a, a feature of the of that way of transacting business and that way of changing it. You don't have to exchange details. It's like not giving away your credit card number a, and a, and a helpful thing for people doing nefarious activities because you can't track that it's used one time. Yeah, until it's used, it just doesn't appear, appear on the blockchain, right? So we're going to generate a new address. It would be like generating a new credit card every time I would go out to do a, a transaction or whatnot. And they also do that in addition to security. They also do that for the very simple reason of bookkeeping. They need to know which victims have made their payments and which ones haven't so that they can provide the decryption key as necessary or withhold that decryption key for those that have not made their payments. So if they provide a unique address, a unique payment address to each victim, then it's really easy for them to track who's paid and who hasn't. And for those of you who haven't done the research, it is amazing how well organized some of these ransomware gangs are. We use the word gangs because it has sort of a, a negative connotation, but they are very well organized. They've got HR programs, benefits, vacation days, you name it. Yeah, um, absolutely. You can imagine their spreadsheet, right? With everybody, all the addresses assigned to which victims and then kind of, you know, crossing, checking the boxes, everybody makes their payments. Yeah, and, and actually what, what we saw in, uh, so we're talking about Colonial uh, Pipeline in a second. What we saw, and DarkSide didn't mean to get so much publicity, but they're actually really smart about demanding uh, ransomware payment that they're confident and they know from, you know, having uh, looked at, you know, uh, dwelled in your system for some period of time, knowing that you could pay it, right? So that they make ransomware payments that are sort of well within the means of their victims. Sure, meet the economic expectations of your victims, right? <laughs> so the FBI isn't talking uh, about this very much, Pamela, but they, uh, so they recovered, they, they, you know, waved the flag, very exciting. Congratulations to all the agents involved. They were able to recover roughly half of the Bitcoin, which was used for the Colonial Pipeline ransomware. So our audience is dying to know how might that uh, have happened? Again, I know you're not giving away any trade secrets here, but I mean, we're so excited. Tell us about this. Well, we are next week. I am going to go into the financial flows. I'm going to look at the cryptocurrency flows. We're going to build out the graph and take a deep dive into the actual seizure and the funds, the uh, Bitcoin payment that came from Colonial. So that's really exciting. We'll, we'll look at that next week during the, uh, during the discussion. Um, but for with Colonial Pipeline, I can tell you just a little teaser here. Um, FBI did make it clear that they actually gained access and had control over the private key, which tells us it was not confiscated. It wasn't um, recovered at an exchange. So somehow they gained access to the private key. I have a couple different theories I'll throw out there um, next week, but they did actually get control over the private key. They stated this in, in the actual affidavit um, and, and the warrant, they had to write up, you know, the, the warrant and the affidavit are public. Um, so they did actually state that, that they had physical control over the private key. There must have been substantial attaboys going around in the FBI's cyber division on that day. 
Um, so one of the things that um, this sort of brings up though, Pamela, um, so first of all, thank you for that because in next week's keynote, we're gonna talk in a lot more detail and show you exactly how this probably, and as you can tell from Pamela's bona fides, that probably is, is pretty good, um, how this might've happened. One of the um, ancillary effects of that though, Pamela, could be that organizations have an unrealistic expectation that ransomware payments are recoverable. What's your point of view? So the answer is it depends and it's the government answer of it depends. Um, and I hate to give that answer, but it really does. Uh, you know, Colonial was a little bit outside the norm. It was a bit of an, uh, uh, of an exception to the rule in that the amount was, you know, in the millions, which is not the average ransomware payment. So the average ransomware payment, you know, there's different figures. Uh, one of the figures that I go off of puts it at about 340,000 um, per victim. So, you know, at $340,000, uh, most ransomware victims are not going to catch the eye of, you know, the FBI, for example. Uh, obviously with Colonial, when people on the East Coast are, you know, lining up to get gas and putting gas bags in, or putting gas into you know, <laughs> grocery gas, bags, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, all of a sudden now this becomes a national priority. Um, and it and it did lead to some very necessary attention paid to ransomware. We have the White House memo that came out about ransomware. Um, we participated, CypherTrace, I, I represented CypherTrace in the participation of the ransomware task force. Um, and I'll talk more about that next week as well, some of the findings from that. So it, it was very much a, a fortuitous timing in a sense um, to bring all of this to the forefront. However, most victims are not going to get the same assistance. Um, we can track ransomware payments, and we, I've talked about this, right? We, this is what we opened this session with about tracing cryptocurrency. As far as tracing it, you know, and finding it at an exchange, that's very much going to depend on, you know, your incident response firm. Um, does your incident response firm work with a firm like CypherTrace, which there are many that do, we count many as customers. And then also, you know, can we get law enforcement of some level involved to issue those subpoenas or to reach out directly to those exchanges where we may eventually trace those funds to? So it's possible, but then again, it just depends and it depends on your actors. Um, you know, affiliates function a lot differently and I'll, I'm gonna talk about this really in depth because it's a really important concept. You know, that the affiliates, when we're talking about ransomware as a service function totally differently and they have a very different motivation generally financial, um, than the operators themselves, right? And they tend to be more methodical with their funds. They tend to want to hold their funds and they tend to want to be more careful um, to avoid those funds being uh, being uh, recovered or uh, frozen or, or taken at, at, at some point along the chain. Yeah, and, and so more things that you'll talk about next week, I know are sort of Bitcoin versus Monero. Maybe, you know, we'll throw a bone over to the Tesla guy and mention Dogecoin. Just where does that fit in the, where does that fit in the whole mix? But, um, and, and there's sort of differing uh, levels of information and differing uh, abilities to recover in the asset recovery world, right? Between Bitcoin and Monero, probably on the ends of the spectrum. Is that right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, the cryptocurrency type does make a difference. Um, and we'll talk about some advances that are being made on the ability to, to trace and see Monero payments. Interesting. So what else should we look forward to hearing more about when you have your amazing keynote next week at the great plan at the at the Denver Virtual <laughs> Cybersecurity Summit? Well, I mean, I like I said, it's never a dull moment. We have Revil in the news, right? Revil sites went down yesterday. Um, nobody, you know, it's, it's still, we're still kind of debating, did somebody actually end up paying that, you know, they dropped the price of the universal decryption key down from 70 million allegedly to 50 million. So somebody did some negotiation there. And apparently now it's just a, you know, 50 million payment to get that universal decryptor. So, um, you know, it's, it's Such just a never deal. do what? Such a deal. Such a deal. I mean, who doesn't have fifty million dollars laying around, right? To right. to to buy into that. So we'll see. Um, you know, even uh, out of the White House on Friday, we had um, you know, the President of the United States made a very clear statement when asked if we should go after servers that are you know being run by ransomware actors, and he said yes. It was a very clear answer. Um, so you know, 
even by next week, we may have, you know, new news, we may have updated current events, uh, issues to report. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an exciting time for sure. Now we're looking forward to seeing you next week, but tell us how our, if our audience wants to learn more about you, learn more about Cyphertrace and what you do, what should they do? Yeah, so if you would like to learn more about Cyphertrace, it's very simple. You can go to our website. We have a newsletter that goes out every week. We also have quarterly anti-money laundering reports that cover the entire crypto ecosystem. And all of that's available and free for um, anybody that's interested in getting into uh, just the ecosystem and learning more about the industry. Now, there'll be a ton more information that we'll share next week. Uh, before we do, um, let me just sort of give a couple of quick announcements. So uh, Data Connectors, uh, largest cybersecurity community in North America. We're delighted to have over 650,000 members, of which we'll see many hundreds of them uh, this week, tomorrow. And I'll mention that in a second at the Great Plains Summit. Uh, probably a thousand of them uh, for, to watch Pamela at the Denver Virtual Cybersecurity Summit. Um, we will be in person going back to cybersecurity conferences starting in September for those of you that are interested in our virtual summits have been uh, quite busy of late. So there's, there's sort of a lot to see within the virtual summit environment. Now we also have some uh, uh, exciting news for tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow is the Great Plains Virtual Cybersecurity Summit. There is still time to register. We have a, a wonderful host, a wonderful panel of CISOs from the area, as well as two keynote presentations um, and some folks that you'll be familiar with, uh, Pamela. Joe Scargill, who's from the uh, United States Secret Service. He is a former protective detail Secret Service agent who now works in cybersecurity, which is interesting, uh, and heads the Minneapolis field office. We'll be talking about some local stories there. We're also delighted to have Matt Lyons, who's a former analyst from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, you know, I know Pamela, you and I didn't talk about this before, but what he's going to talk about is interesting, and it's the, the great Islamic terrorist cyber attacks that never came and why didn't they come and what happened and there was so much trepidation right after 9 11 and so much planning for oh it's coming and it never actually happened so that's all happening tomorrow and there's still time to register uh for that fabulously interesting conversation uh, and then last but not least my last quick commercial is for our cyber connect web briefing so uh there's a host of them available on demand i've referenced two of them here uh the uh, most recent one is on defining a CARTA approach to zero trust access, has a great CISO panel debating that issue. Uh, and then prior to that, also on demand, you can catch uh, stopping privilege escalation without breaking the bank, which was brought to us um, with a preview by IT Group, industry analysts um, with a TiVo network. So some interesting background for those of you there. Uh, Pamela, uh, give us one more thing that we leave our, leave our audience in suspense for your keynote next week. Uh, well, let's see. The thing that I would like to leave everybody with is how much do you think the bad actors, the uh, ransomware operators, listen to what we actually post and webinar and publish as far as our capabilities? They might be listening to us right now. Is that what you're saying? They very well might. That's right. Uh, hopefully we didn't teach them anything uh, helpful, but hopefully we taught all of you something new and exciting that you'll learn. Uh, we thank you very much, uh, Pamela Clegg, for your uh, your interesting background, your bona fides, and all the information that you will share next week at the Denver Virtual Cybersecurity Summit. You can go to dataconnectors.com slash Denver to sign up. You'll see Pamela, as well as a host of educational presentations, panel discussions, all sorts of good stuff. So thank you very much, everyone. This is the end of the session today. Be sure to sign up for both the Cybertrace newsletter and make sure you come to the Virtual Cybersecurity Summit next week in Denver. Thanks a lot.